Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. We're going to just wait a couple more minutes to allow a few more people to sign on. Hey, good evening, folks. I uh, I just put a note up there, and I uh, just want to make sure everybody can see the screen. Uh, hopefully, I can see the screen. Hopefully, you guys can see the screen. Um, so chime in there if you're able to. Um, I think Leslie's still giving it another minute here, and but we're going to roll here in about 30 seconds. Leslie, are you on? I sure am, sir. I'm trying to play with our chat. We're, we're having some chat technical difficulties, but um, uh, I'll, I'll do that and you take over. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to minimize the chat because I know that that was a whole thing last uh when we did so it kind of blocked the screen and <clears throat> goodness knows we don't want to do that so uh yeah heck if we're ready to rock and roll let's do it um good evening everybody this is curtis shock uh the carbon wildcat from <laughs> washington dc and we're uh out here with our team uh, working on some policy initiatives, and we're going to talk about those tonight. Uh, some pretty exciting stuff going on, and then uh, we've got uh, we've got an announcement we're going to make a little bit uh, towards the end of the program. Uh, our plan is to not uh, keep you uh, for too long. We certainly appreciate everybody spending a little bit of time with us here from all across, you know, the U.S. and uh, I think in just about every time zone. So. Uh, again, it doesn't go unnoticed, and we want to be uh, respectful of your time. Um, so we're going to get started. I'm going to try to roll through the deck here and see how we struggle along with that. Uh, this is the agenda for this evening, and uh, we're going to be going uh, through some introductions. Uh, what we're working on, we're going to talk about our uh, legislative uh, policy initiative, um, we're going to introduce the tsunami of strippers, uh, stripper wells, that is, um, and why that's such a, a big deal and is starting to gain uh, really a lot of focus. And certainly uh, here in Washington, D.C., as I know uh, most of us are certainly familiar with this issue. Uh, we got some definitions we'll put out so that people um, can see kind of what we're what we are talking about as we're moving forward here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the 
uh, 45Q tax credit program, um, which is something that we've had on our radar screen for a while now. And um, we are uh, we'll give you a, some insight into those meetings today and uh, some traction that's starting to take place there, which is really uh, huge uh, for the industry. And then we'll take some questions and answers. And then, like I said, we got a special announcement that's uh, pretty exciting for all of us here at the Well Done Foundation. So with that, again, I'm Curtis Shuck, the chairman of the Well Done Foundation. Uh, and uh, all that means is that I'm the I am the longest standing volunteer in the organization. Uh, I do have a day job. I actually have two day jobs. Um, and uh, I am a 100 percent volunteer for this organization, have been from day one. Uh, Leslie Sebastian is joining us. Leslie is the vice president of development. Uh, she wears, like all of us, many hats and a in a uh, in a very uh, lean organization, we all do just about everything. And Leslie has been really driving uh, in, in addition to a lot of other initiatives, uh, a lot of our social media platforms. So kudos to her. We've got some uh, information today on uh, some of those uh, analytics for the last thirty days, and definitely have been hit. <laughs> Hitting some new uh, some new highlights there in terms of marks of engagements and comments, um, and of course, which I uh, read only a few of those because drives me crazy. But a lot of dialogue, and we appreciate all of you kind of jumping in on that and uh, and self policing and and uh, talking through that with folks who might not otherwise be so kind. We do have a bit of a no troll policy here at the Well Done Foundation, uh, which then I violate once in a while when somebody pushes the button. But anyway, uh, there you have it. So here we go. We're going to start uh, getting into the program today. Uh, so uh, we wanted to go through uh, just a couple of definitions that are going to set the stage for today's discussion. Um, and the first one is really kind of key to what's happening for us anyway, for Well Done Foundation, as we're discussing this year's policy initiative, which is the definition of a stripper well. And, and uh, by definition, uh, the U.S. government has defined a stripper well as being a well that produces less than 15 barrels per day of oil. Uh, there is also a discussion, and many of these are synonymous, of a marginal well or an uneconomic well, and they are often referred to, you know, in the in the same case uh, over any number of of subjects. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about well life cycle because I think that's something uh, that's important to highlight uh, for just uh, all of us to be aware of for sure as we're kind of going through this exercise. Um, all right, so uh, yeah, Houston, we got a problem, right? Um, for those of you that are on this call today, I mean, you, you know our commitment to the orphan well space and our passion uh, around making a difference uh, one well at a time and leaving things better than the way we found them. And we're out there doing it every day, and many of you are involved in this initiative as well. And you know, we couldn't be prouder of the work that uh, you guys are doing that we're all doing together. The reality is uh, that that's great, and and I think everybody understands that that the orphan well number in the U.S., which is estimated from, you know, a couple hundred thousand to millions uh, and beyond, is not a fixed number. Um, and that number is subject to growth as more wells are being discovered. Um, there are many uh, orphan wells that are undocumented, especially in uh, Appalachia, up in some of those legacy areas of Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York, West Virginia. Um, and, and then as more operators who are struggling then, and, and I just saw this, this last week in California, I was at a group of wells, not too far from this photograph that we have as a background here, which is out in the Kern field in, uh, in central California in Kern, uh, in Kern County. 
But I was measuring wells out there this last week with the team uh, that are now orphans that two years ago, excuse me, three years ago in 2021, uh, were still being operated. You know, what's interesting, though, is that those wells that were being operated then um, mysteriously don't have pump jacks in the, on them any longer or really anything of any value. Those have all been um, those have all been removed. Uh, and gone. But so this the key there, again, is this number of orphan wells is is very much a moving target. And, and this is part of the problem, which, again, as I mentioned earlier, is this tsunami of stripper wells. And uh, we've been working uh, with a, a great friend of the Well Done Foundation and certainly, uh, you know, a leader in this space, a fellow by the name of Dwayne Purvis, who is a uh, uh, petroleum geologist, or excuse me, petroleum engineer, uh, but also a bit of an uh, economist, and has really been kind of diving into this. And you know, I met him last year in uh, in Oklahoma uh, at the AAPG uh, conference on orphan wells, and was super impressed with his work. And so we've been working together. And just apologies, by the way, for our not attending this year because uh, we certainly wanted to be, but we were actually out here in, in Turn Field in uh, Central California working on some measurements. But Dwayne's comments last year about this number of uh, uneconomic wells and stripper wells uh, really started to pique my interest. And it wasn't until uh, just uh, about a month ago where we started working on this little project together that it hit me like a freight train. And, and here's what I uh, here's what I want to share with you folks. And this is what we're talking, of, of course, as part of our policy initiative this year. <clears throat> and this information is coming directly from the EIA, which is the Energy Information Administration. Uh, you know, part of uh, uh, part of our active uh, uh, government uh, funded programs here. And, and these are some numbers that are literally fresh from the web website. And I actually had to do some adjustment in, in our white paper that we're presenting to the, on the legislative side. But of the, in, in this particular case, of the 900,000 active wells in the U.S. today, and we th think that number is certainly subject to review, but we're going with it. And so that's what we're using. And that's what we're basing this uh, this discussion on today, of the 900,000 wells that the EIA says are active today, only 150,000 of those are in the shale category, part of the, the recent shale boom from starting around 2005, and are higher producing more conventional wells. The other 750,000 of those wells are literally listed as stripper wells or in that stripper category. And I'm gonna show you this next graphic, which to me is like the alarm clock. Uh, it's literally the 80-20 rule. And, and you look at this, and this was a head scratcher for me. I'm looking at this and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I mean, this is like huge. You can see, that 80% again of the, and this is just a different way of, of showing that, but again, this is right off of the EIA website, literally from just a couple of days ago. So it's not like something that was you know that old. Now, of course the data was based back in 2022, but look at this. You can see that the, that those, the lighter colored blue are actually all of the blue up to the, up to that dark line there are literally in the stripper category. And so, Again, that is 80% of the inventory uh, out there are in that sort of marginal category. Now, why that's important and why I, you know, we think that this is something that, you know, we really need to continue to raise the awareness of um, from a legislative perspective, for sure, uh, as we're looking at these initiatives on orphan well funding and, you know, how do we, you know, how do we uh, promote, you know, moving to, you know, making some real improvements in the reduction of methane gas and, and um, you know, doing a solid for the climate and for the future generations. This is, a, this is something that really we need to be aware of. 
mentioned earlier this notion of well uh, life cycle. And, and so first of all, I, I, I wanted to go uh, back before we leave this slide and, and just say that, that Dwayne has done an amazing job of sort of breaking this down further in kind of a state by state uh, type of an analysis of where those wells are located. This is uh, kind of on a national basis, but there are some states of course that are faced with <clears throat> significant issues uh, in terms of, of these, you know, stripper wells or marginal wells or, you know, uneconomic wells. Uh, and, and also many of these wells are actually in the idle category. So some of those in the lower brackets here are wells that are that are idle, they're shut in and uh, you know categorized as shut in and it varies from state to state, the sort of what those requirements are, um, what the sort of the, uh, the level of patience on the regulatory side is to allow those wells to be continue to be idle. But think of it from an operator perspective. You know, from an operator perspective, you know, and, and first of all, remember that the wells that we're talking about in these categories here are not wells that are operated by the super majors, right, folks? I mean, these aren't uh, XTO wells. These aren't uh, these aren't shell wells or not, uh, you know, they're, they're certainly not Chevron wells for the most part. I mean, these are wells that have been transacted and transferred and, and, um, and have sort of been sold and moved down the line from, you know, the, the tier one operators to the tier two, three, four kind of trickle their way down all the way down to, you know, mom and pop oil in some cases. And, and and so these are folks, and, and those transactions were done legitimately and and you know by the book, and and now here they are sitting in the lap of of someone who is thinking to themselves, oh my gosh, you know I'm making a couple of barrels a day, you know it's okay when oil's at sixty bucks a barrel, better when it's at a hundred, it's devastating when it's at twenty. And, and so what's happening here is that this number continues to grow. And so if you don't have money uh, to operate the well or marginal money to operate the well, you certainly don't have money to maintain and do improvements to the field. And, and, and it's just this cascading effect of, of potential problems. And, and, and again, we're not looking to villainize anyone in this program, right? I mean, we all know the oil and gas industry is probably one of the most highly, if not the most highly regulated industry in the world. Um, and, and so this, our, our deal here today is not fling and poo. Uh, that's just not what we do. We're, you know, we're out there to make a difference. And we tell folks this all the time, and, you know, it's, it should be in our mission, but probably can't put it in there. It's PG, but you know, we're in the get shit done business. And, uh, but this is certainly something that we're highly focused on into the future is how do we deal with this? Because it's coming, it's coming right down the road. So this is a, this is a graph that I put together the other day. And again, this is example only, it's just for illustrative purposes. This is not any kind of, uh, <clears throat> of a, uh, you know, a, a characterization uh, of wells, uh, other than the fact that every well has a life cycle, just like each of us have a life cycle. You know, all of the, all infrastructure has a life cycle. Now that life cycle curve can certainly be uh, either extended or shortened depending on how well you take care of yourself, how much you maintain the well, how, you know, how active you are and really working it. If you're not active, you're sedentary, you sit on the couch, you don't do much, and your life cycle may be affected by that. It's so very much the same thing in the well program. And what I've highlighted here with this red circle is that at some point, uh, there comes an inflection point. And that inflection point, like you see here, is when <clears throat> the production of oil 
uh, dips below the cost to produce. And all of a sudden, the entire world changes uh, for that particular well. And again, every well is different. Every well has a personality. Uh, every operator is different. And every operator has a different philosophy and a different uh, manner in which they operate by. Um, you know, in a perfect world, the operator would see that coming, right? Like they would be making preparations in this example in year one through 10 uh, for years 31 through 40. And hopefully they don't let it get out to 50 years before something is done about it. Because again, costs don't go down. Uh, I don't know, you know, last time any of you were at the grocery store, the same as me. Those costs aren't going anywhere but up, folks. And it's the same way on the in the oil and gas space uh, for plugging and abandoning. Uh, it's a crazy market out there. And and so once the once the production uh, passes below the cost to produce, now all of a sudden this is an uneconomic well. What happens oftentimes then, depending on the operator, and this is again, is not a slam or any kind of a general characterization, but what happens is that well goes into idle status. We call it cheap to keep mode, right? And that is where, hey man, guess what? I, it's too expensive for me to do anything, so I'm gonna do nothing. You know, That's a very valid business strategy, the do nothing approach. Ask my wife. I exercise that all the time. Drives her crazy. Um, <clears throat> but the problem is, is that if that is left in that idle status and that do nothing approach continues, at some point, some event, uh, watershed or black swan event could occur and that business is in trouble. And if that business fails at that point, then what happens is that those wells have nowhere else to go but into the orphan program. Now, there are examples, uh, and you're probably very keenly aware of those across the country, where large holdings, large companies <clears throat> that have a significant number of marginal wells uh, or, or stripper wells, will get into peril, will, you know, go through any number of, of uh, you know, save yourself moves and, and maybe not make it. And in what a, an organization or a regulatory body may do then at that point is look, they're just trying to, they're just trying to grab for life rings at, at that point. And, and what they allow to happen then are for uh, some of those wells and to potentially be taken over by operators that have an interest in in that, so they'll they'll do you know some cherry picking of those wells, but they're still left behind with a, a potentially a large number then that are uneconomic, <clears throat> and no one is interested at all in in picking up the liability. I'm going to give you a great example that we're going through right now in the state of California. We're in the process in Santa Barbara County of plugging our first wells there. Um, and the state of California has recently uh, passed some legislation which requires uh, anyone uh, acquiring a well to post the uh, full amount of the plugging costs. Uh, and that is going to be then based on uh, uh, an estimate, a recent estimate from, uh, you know, a, call it a qualified uh, plugging and abandonment outfit. And we're going through this right now in California. And I will tell you, the wells that we're working on in Santa Barbara County, they're not cheap, folks. And, and these wells are well over $100,000 uh, each uh, on the estimated plugging cost. And what's happening in California, and this is, this is a movement that's starting to happen uh, across the country. You're seeing there's a lot of push for increasing financial assurances uh, across these many states. So what's happening is this in California is that you can't, we're like, we're working with a company, like I said, in, in uh, Santa Maria right now. And that company has been trying to acquire another company, um, essentially uh, assume it or look at it entering into a joint venture. But if there is a change of ownership uh, in for more than 
then that new entity or the new 51 percenter at that point has to post uh, this financial assurance to this new level. Now, look, that's not bad, right? That's not bad at all, but that's a heavy lift. When you're an organization that's looking at it, acquiring a couple of hundred wells, uh, a couple of hundred wells at, you know, a couple of hundred thousand dollars a piece. I mean, that doesn't take long, folks, and that's some real darn money going on there. And, and so what's happening then, again, is it's not even allowing some of these uh, companies that are potentially struggling or in trouble to then be able to sell their assets or transfer their assets because that liability factor is so high. So what is teeing up? Uh, as you can imagine, as we're looking at this well life cycle and you're picturing, you know, this earlier example here of this, just the sheer number of wells that are out there hanging, <clears throat> is that we've got to come up with a strategy to be able to deal with this, to, to be preemptive. You know, there's a couple of solutions that are obviously being talked about all over the Beltway, as you can imagine. You know, the first of, of course, is you know, regulatory enforcement and, uh, you know, bigger hammer place to stand, you know, you can move the world. Well, uh, you can imagine, you know, how the operators feel about that. I mean, they're all lining up to take a piece of that. That's for sure. Um, and, and then you have an issue where, you know, this is a state's rights issue and it varies uh, greatly from one state to the next in uh, perhaps how some of those regulatory uh, requirements are actually being enforced on the ground. The next of, uh, is of course, this discussion of methane fees. Well, if you're, if you're emitting, then you should be paying. Uh, and then there's a question of, well, how do, we, how do we figure out what that is? Obviously it comes into the realm of measuring and monitoring and quantifying methane, which, you know, that's what we do as part of our work, but it's it is this notion of it being an obligatory program, and and you know now you know we have folks like the EDF that just announced you know their methane spy satellite up there. Uh, you know, spoiler alert: the NASA has been flying for years now and and alerting, but the EDF's out there with their program. And, and I think that there's just this sense that, you know what, the, the window is closing, the, the noose is closing, uh, and, and it's making oil and gas operations more and more and more difficult and more and more expensive, which just puts added pressure on uh, stripper well or marginal well operators who are uh, hanging on by a thread as it goes, right? Um, and, and so that certainly is a, is a challenge. And, and then, of course, there's uh, our favorite, which is the collaborative approach for a win-win. And, you know, I think in our uh, kind of our uh, position on life around here is let's always look for a, a way to provide everybody, you know, a hand up, right? Let's, let's work with everybody so that everybody succeeds in, in this at the end of the day. And, and so that's part of what our discussion is in the Beltway this week is this notion of, of a collaborative approach of providing operators with um, not a free pass, right? It's, it's never about a free pass. And, and that's the conversation that we had all day long I can, you know, I'm hoarse today because we've been talking about it so much. It, it's not a free pass for an operator. Um, the operator still has responsibility, but what it is, is it's a hand up. And, and it's also, if you think about it, it's, it's actually kind of a preemptive move and a save yourself move uh, on behalf of the, the states through the federal government to keep these wells out of orphan status. Hey, let's face it, folks. M many companies exit strategy for these marginal wells is not to go to the bank and ask for a loan to, to support them with their plugging liability. It's to hang up the phone, turn off the lights, walk out the door, close it and throw away the key. And unfortunately, 
that happens more than you know. So we've got to create a way out with dignity. We've got to create a win-win uh, scenario. And, and so what we've been proposing here for a while now, and it's just starting to really get some legs, is the expansion of the 45Q tax credit program. And we've got a white paper that we prepare and we're happy to share it. And certainly we are in by no means experts in this at all. Uh, but all we're doing is we're raising our hand and we're saying, we've got to, we've got to do something. And, and believe me, we're not the, the well done foundation. This isn't our space. I mean, our space is out in the field. I'd much rather be out there uh, than cruising around the beltway, you know, uh, carbon wildcatting, but somebody has got to do something. Somebody has got to light this match and get this puppy going here. So what we've started talking about then is looking at ways to get these marginal wells plugged through uh, a genre like, or a position like the 45Q tax credit program. Now the 45Q tax credit program was really developed around uh, carbon capture um, and how to provide some incentivization for the carbon capture uh, development. And it, look, that's great. It looks like it's working. Um, and, and there's all kinds of, there are all kinds of intricacies around that as we were talking today, uh, to the Senate finance committee, who is the, the organization that's charged with really putting these programs together and overseeing the 45Q tax credit program. Um, it, it's the fact that it's, it's very labor intensive. There's a lot of reporting. There's a lot of math and a lot of work that needs to happen to be able to do this. Um, but it's happening and, and the program is there. The other obvious benefit, of course, is the fact that methane emissions are being eliminated or avoided. Uh, one of the discussions that we've been having uh, kind of across the country right now, and this has to do with that marginal, excuse me, the methane elimination, excuse me, methane emission reduction uh, program, which is MERPS, uh, which was recently announced by the Department of Energy and the Environmental Protection Agency uh, for some operator qualifying wells, <coughs> is that through that process, methane has to be measured and quantified. Well, so say I'm a company who has been working really hard and I've been spending a lot of money uh, in my um, you know, ESG space and I've been, I've been mapping my uh, methane emissions, I've been uh, pinpointing leaks, I've been going out and fixing them. Uh, and now all of a sudden I'm faced with a, an opportunity to maybe help to reduce some of my plugging liability, but I have to show that I'm reducing emissions when I'm I've been spending, you know, millions and gazillions of dollars on making that happen. So part of the discussion is it's not only methane emissions eliminated, but it's also calculating methane emissions avoided. For those of you that are in the orphan well space or that have worked around idle wells or, or uh, you know, marginal wells, shut-in wells, you know as well as I do that just because a well isn't leaking today doesn't mean that you can go back to that same well tomorrow and it won't be leaking, whether it's from just deterioration, external environmental forces, other physical forces. But <clears throat> this notion of being able then to quantify the avoidance of potential emissions is, is killer and, and is really critical. And then, of course, the quantifiable results, like at the end of the day, the data that's collected, the measurements that are done have to be done with the right equipment by the right people safely in a way that the industry um, accepts that uh, and can stand behind it. This has to be a collaboration. It's got to be a bipartisan, non-denominational effort. Uh, in order for it to be successful. People have to be able to, to be, you know, stand behind this and feel good about the results at the end of the day. So <clears throat> what we're working on uh, right now in the Beltway is, <clears throat> is, again, is the presentation 
uh, of this notion. We had seven meetings today, which is if you, any of you spend any time on the Hill at all, you know that that's a really long day. Um, uh, we were started the morning in the Senate side and the pouring down rain ended up uh, finishing up in the House side today. Uh, bipartisan across the aisles, folks uh, who have nothing to do with the orphan well program or the marginal well program. Um, we're at the table. We're listening intently. You know, I think showing some of those slides that we shared with you earlier are definitely you know, uh, the cause for certainly sitting up and taking note. Um, and, and this is just the beginning of the journey. You know, the deal is, is that the Well Done Foundation is not a policy shop. It's not our forte. Uh, our job, again, is to is to take action and make things happen. But what we can do and what we are doing is we are providing real uh, life and real case examples of how these programs are working in the field, of what our experience is in the field with wells that are failing or wells that we're measuring, uh, things that we're seeing like this, again, this picture that you see behind me today. You know, every one of those wells that you see behind you there, and not everyone, but certainly the 80-20 rule, of all of the hundreds of wells that you can see just in that photograph alone, just remember that 80 of those are marginal or stripper wells. So uh, taking action is is really critical. So what we're doing is we're just starting down the road. Obviously, there's going to need to be coalitions that are built, um, both uh, you know in the House and the Senate uh, on the political side, uh, on a, from a bipartisan basin uh, basis, excuse me. But more importantly, is coming from industry and coming from NGOs and coming like ourselves coming from academia that can get behind a program that can take some action and, and really help to affect some change. Uh, one of the things that's critical, and, and you know what, I heard this time and time again today, which was very heartening, because these are folks that are 25 years old, and you all know that that's pretty much how our government is run these days by a bunch of 20-somethings. The lucky thing is they're really smart folks and they're really passionate, but they understand that this isn't an issue that we can just sort of wait around and see what happens, right? They understand that that we need to get moving on this and really come up with some, get some tough decisions made. Uh, today with the Senate Finance Committee, uh, we had, you know, just some really great words of encouragement, some uh, some leads on helping to continue to build the coalition. Look, this is far beyond the scope of the Well Done Foundation. It's not even within our charter uh, to be lobbyists and to, to be able to do this work. But we can support and we can provide and we can raise the flag to say this is something that we need to work on. So Obviously, we're working with partners and we'll be developing uh, more partnerships around this to move this forward. Because, again, it's the right thing to do. Look, this orphan well thing isn't going away anytime soon. And there's plenty of work out there right now for everybody. We don't need to make this worse. We need to make it better. So uh, so what we're doing now is we're working together with the team at the Well Done Foundation, with some of our other partners across the country. Uh, gathering more data, developing, um, you know, stronger positions, uh, doing more work in the House and the Senate side with select members there uh, that are willing and, and looking at championing an initiative like this on a bipartisan basis. You know, one thing I learned long ago in business is that if it makes sense, it probably doesn't make sense. You know, I mean, this is just one of those things that just simply makes sense. So how do we get that across the line? There's going to be lots of opportunity uh, for all of us to participate and comment and to provide uh, input into this program. But, you know, and what's so great about this, similar to the orphan well issue, is that, look, it's not rocket science. Like, we can fix this. We can do it. Uh, we have the ability to do it. Let's let's do it, right? Let's get after it and and really make things happen. And so, 
Um, that's where we're at. That's our that's our update. We're uh, we'll have a more formalized report that uh, we're going to be distributing. Uh, we will make copies of the white paper available for folks to look at and comment. Again, uh, by no means uh, are we experts in this or looking to you know uh, to to be that person. We're just working as part of the team to get this initiative going. Uh, and uh, and let's see what we can do. Let's see if we can make a change. Um, with that, we're going to move into some questions and answers. And Leslie is going to uh, to field that for us. So she's awesome at that. But before we do, uh, I promised that I had a I had a spoiler alert uh, announcement that I we wanted to make. I got a call today from uh, the office in Bozeman. Um, who let me know that uh, it's my loving wife, Stacy Shuck, uh, that she had in her hot little hands um, an approved permit from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources on the McCleary unit number one, which is an, uh, an orphan well that we're working on in uh, Akron, Ohio. We've actually been on that well for, uh, gosh, almost three years now. And it's one that will probably be included in <clears throat> in one of our memoirs at some point in time. It's had such an amazing story behind it. Uh, the family who initially contacted us, the the work uh, with the operator who uh, had gone bankrupt and left this large holding uh, behind. And it was one of those stories where the the operator was gone and then is deceased. And so literally dead and gone, um, the, the program had to go through the court system. Uh, the landowner had to, you know, file uh, lit a litigation against the estate, which was gone. Uh, and it's been just this amazing process here to be able to bring this well full circle. But, you know, what's exciting is that we've had many folks who have been participating in this well as, uh, as uh, donors and as uh, funding partners, uh, folks like the Youth Climate Initiative uh, out, of, uh, out of North Carolina. Uh, just a, a number of folks have been uh, working together with us on this. And so we're happy to announce tonight uh, that we have the permit in hand, that we're working with the plug-in crew right now in, uh, in Ohio to get this scheduled. And we're, uh, we're hoping that we're going to get this puppy done uh, before the 1st of April. So, you know, this will be the first uh, well plug for well done. Uh, in the 2024 season and we'll kick off just a whole slew of other work but what we're also excited about is now that we've got this one well kind of completed and through the system uh, in ohio that it will open the door for the many others that were left behind by this particular operator so with that leslie let's go ahead and we'll take some questions um curtis you have to enable chat i can't oh well heck let's i That'll be a good one. Thank uh, you. And uh, you know what we might even have to do is I might have to read them myself while we're looking at that. Let me do this. I'm going to run through the chat here because I can see it. Um, thanks, James Stewart. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. A uh, great one from <laughs> from uh, David uh, Calibro, and appreciate that David, who is asking the question: Is Congress prepared to provide funding for the Well Done Foundation? Well, <clears throat> Dave, let me tell you this: uh, to date, the Well Done Foundation has not accepted a single dollar of taxpayer money for plugging wells. Um, we are measuring wells under the federal program for states but not uh, on the plugging side. Um, you know, I would tell you, hey, look, it would be great uh, if, if that would happen and we would certainly, you know, welcome it and, and work together, um, you know, to get more wells plugged. You know, we tell people this all the time, Dave, that we have a plugging problem. 
uh, well, I do uh, particularly have a well plugging problem, which is, you know, we'll raise a little bit of money with the foundation. Next thing you know, you know, my wife's looking around, you know, where's Curtis? Oh gosh, she's with the team and they're out there plugging another well. And, you know, and that's kind of been the way that it, it goes. Um, that's why we were so involved in the early days in 2020 with the American Carbon Registry and started this notion of looking at carbon finance as a vehicle to enhance our car washes and bake sales, which, you know, I tell people is pretty much how we fund things. Even today, we, we have some amazing corporate sponsors. We have all of you who are, you know, individual donors and, uh, and, you know, so believe me, I'm, I'm definitely not downplaying that, but, but absolutely. But one of the things that's important is that that's not our driving factor, right? Just like the story I just told you about with uh, the McCleary number one well, like we look at other factors beyond what the carbon credit value is for us. This is still a mission of passion and we hope it will be. And we would certainly welcome uh, funding from any source to plug more wells, Dave. Thanks. Uh, Robert Sanchez is asking, is a well done uh, foundation working with tribal governments to cap old orphan wells on native land? The answer to that is yes, uh, we sure are, Robert. In fact, we plugged four wells this last summer <clears throat> on the Blackfeet uh, Sovereign Nation in, uh, in Glacier County, Montana. Uh, and we're looking at doing more work of that. We've been uh, doing some work with the Chippewa Cree tribe also in Montana and certainly are looking at this all over. We, you know, orphan wells don't have a conscience and they don't have a boundary. Uh, and so everyone is certainly is something that we would look hard at and, and work together with, again, the sovereign nation uh, to get these projects done. Uh, Dan Arthur. <laughs> Uh, awesome. Dan is talking about uh, the B carbon uh, protocol specifically set for idle wells. I think that's great. And you know what? Dan's a great friend and partner of Well Done's. And, and that's absolutely something that is important is to look at all of those tools in the tool bucket. Uh, and certainly, how can we use that B carbon uh, protocol? To, uh, to get these wells done, and then how can we move this into scale? You know, the discussion around the 45Q tax credit program is not to upend the carbon market, but it's to provide a, a, another way of scaling the work and, and getting more done. So thanks for that, Dan. Uh, Luke White's asking, hey, are you familiar with the uh, st political strategy plan known as Project 2025? Uh, if you so, do you view it as being a threat to the mission of the Well Done Foundation? Um, you know, I would tell you, Luke, uh, I am not, but certainly would love to have a look at that. You know what, Luke, I would tell you um, that if the if the work of the Well Done Foundation is accomplished by Project 2025 or any other outfit out there. You know what? That would be great because that's a win for all of us. Look, we're not here to build a kingdom and a fiefdom. We're here to make things happen one well at a time. And if there's a way of doing that, then bring it on. Uh, Rachel uh, McGonigal is asking if we know anything about the funding that has come uh, to the state of Kansas to plug orphan wells. And, you know, Rachel, we're uh, certainly are aware of a couple of avenues there, some of that being the federal funding through the IIJA program. Uh, there certainly are other funding streams uh, under the marginal well program that's happening there. And um, we also, by the way, and this is kind of a mea culpa from my side, we, we're working with a landowner in Southeast Kansas right now. And I'm about two weeks behind uh, from getting out on location and, and getting those projects kicked off. But Rachel, I would uh, encourage you to give me a call sometime. Would love to chat with you further about that. But I will tell you, we started working in Kansas in 2021. Morgan Powell, uh, what happened to the initiative to bring on more volunteers? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Thank you. Oh, sorry, not blah, blah, blah. Seems like more hands would lead to that. 
Um, and thanks for all you do. And thank you for that, Morgan. Uh, Morgan, uh, you're absolutely right. That is uh, an initiative for us. It still is very critical. We've been doing some work on the back end uh, to make sure that we are prepared and have the infrastructure uh, to be able to uh, to be able to handle uh, working with volunteers. We have recently announced our QMS program, which is the Qualified Measurement Specialist Program, uh, which is certainly something that would work uh, great with that. And so I, I guess, Morgan, my note to you is don't give up on us. Um, and, you know, please let's find out a way to get you out there and, and get you going, all right? Uh, uh, let's see here, Sean Martinez, um, do you have to pull well casing or do you pump grout, uh, to, or plug with bentonite? You know, uh, that's a great question. And here is the answer to that, uh, kind of yes to all of the above. And what it is, is it really kind of depends on the, the jurisdiction, on the geology, on the uh, on the plugging design, everyone uh, everyone varies. I would tell you, uh, we've done all of those, uh, and sometimes on the very same well. So yes, you know the key there, and one of the things that is really important with the well done model is that when we go into a new area, we're working and relying heavily on the local contractors. Um, and working on building that collaboration with the regulatory agencies uh, to really help to ensure the best possible outcome. Look, this is this work is sketchy enough, and and you know we just need to leave those egos on the table and use those people that have those expertise. So uh, absolutely, we we certainly appreciate that. Um, Rachel's got another quick question here that says, can a corporation get carbon credits for plugging wells? Um, and, and the answer to the short answer to that is yes. Uh, and there's a couple of ways that they certainly can, uh, they certainly can do that. <laughs> and uh, there's, you know, certainly some opportunities out there and we got all kinds of great partners that can, that can talk about how that is. Um, and feel free, please, to to reach out and uh, we can share some of those partners that we've got and give you some uh, some program. Uh, Dan, thank you for that comment. Appreciate it. Uh, Michael Upton, uh, appreciate the work for Plug and Orphan Wells. I live in Pittsburgh. Okay, awesome. Um, and uh, he's talking about uh, wells in Pennsylvania and the work that uh, that is happening there with PADEP and the federal funds. Uh, Michael, yes, I would tell you we have several well projects uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, we're going to be uh, with the advent here of the approval of the uh, Ohio project. Uh, I'm probably leaving for Appalachia uh, um, this next week and, you know, be out there until we get things uh, going and up and rolling. So we will be up in Pennsylvania. We have a number of wells in Erie County. Um, you know, we actually uh, we actually plugged our first well in Pennsylvania out in Bradford, uh, and um, you know that was a, a who that well was actually drilled in 1880, and we were able to accomplish that with corporate partners like Seneca Resources. And so, yes, the short answer there is we're absolutely in in Pennsylvania, uh, and look forward to seeing you out there sometime. Um, so, uh, Javier, uh, Villarreal is asking if we have any, uh, projects in the deep South of Texas. Well, uh, Javier, I would tell you, we actually have an office in the Permian Basin. So we, uh, base, uh, ourselves out of Hobbs, New Mexico, uh, which is where I'm headed, uh, after this trip and a brief, uh, tour back to Montana. Uh, and we have been working uh, certainly in uh, Pecos County and some of those areas. We've done projects in Houston uh, uh, and we've got projects in the eastern side of Texas. So, yes, the short answer there is that uh, we're all about um, you know, working in the great state of Texas, uh, second only to the state of Alaska. No, no kidding. But uh, no, we're very very excited to be in Texas. And if you've got some 
uh, ideas for us and love you, for you to share them with us and uh, we can talk about how we can collaborate there. Oh, folks, I appreciate you taking the time today to hang out with uh, the likes of us and, you know, for all of the support, you know, <laughs> Sometimes out there, it uh, it gets a little, you know, days are long and the miles are longer. And we wonder if, you know, if this is all, this is worth it. And we get some of those comments from you guys on Facebook or on uh, LinkedIn or on Instagram. And, you know, and I'll just tell you that that's what gives me the energy to keep on going. So, you know, we appreciate everything that you do. This is a team sport. We say that all the time. And uh, just seeing you folks here tonight, you know, there was what, 34 uh, folks at one point on the on the call tonight. You know, I, I tell you what, that's going to give us some wind in our sails and help us through the next couple of rounds of meetings and on to the next project. So, folks, thank you uh, so very much uh, for your great support. Uh, Leslie, thanks for hanging out and driving the bus here. And uh, folks, this is Curtis Shock, the Carver Wildcat from <laughs> Washington, D.C., and we'll see you real soon. Thanks, everyone, for being here. We'll be having more webinars in the future, and I'll be sending out the um, PowerPoint. And if you have questions, please respond. Thanks again. And we're out. Thanks, Les. Thanks, Curtis.